So now that we've started the recording, welcome to the the Sunday Sangha. <laughs> uh, and uh, Joe, you were asking a question following along from what we had already started talking about, which was the variations in the suttas and what we find as a huge collection of the Pali Canon. Well, guess what? The Pali Canon is not the same Pali Canon in Thailand than it is in Burma. There are some works that are, uh, it, that's especially true in the um, Kundan and the Kaya, that is a whole collection of things. Uh, and basically you could say that that's kind of a grab bag that has both the oldest and the newest stuff and all of the other things kind of fit in between. An example is the precepts themselves are never found in any of the suttas. Mm. It's only found in the uh, Kundan and the Kaya, which probably indicates that this is very, very recent. Another uh, one is, in fact, it's begin to, uh, to get um, some of the mistakes that had been historically made in the, in the Western Buddhism's uh, understanding have been slow to get changed in. One example was is that they misunderstood the actual date of Buddha's uh, birth and death, leaving him to die at about uh, 480 BC, where in fact that looks more closely to the time that he was born and that he died very close to uh, 410, 408, uh, perhaps as late as uh, 400 BC. Um, and um, because they can uh, better understand the genealogy of the kings and the area and that kind of stuff that they can nail that kind of thing down. All right. So uh, with those uh, issues about dating, that's also true when we're trying to date the suttas because there's some of us that hold that the older it is, the closer it is to the teachings of the Buddha, except that the Buddha taught <laughs> for 40, 45 years. And that as he taught, there were changes made along the way and ways of doing things and ways of talking as well as the introduction of new people. An example is, is that Sariputta came in a few years after the Buddha, and so he predominates up until the time that Ananda came, which was 25 years after the Buddha. I forget exactly which. It was either 20 and 25 years of the 45, that either Ananda was, was the king for 25 years and then became the Buddha's for 20, or he was, you know, but anyway, he came a bit later. And so we know then that suttas that mention Ananda specifically is within a time frame of about 20 to 25 years. Um, and that the stuff with Sariputta as the uh, object of the would possibly be earlier than that. Now, when we're talking about this, we're actually mentioning mostly the Majjhima Nikaya because the Majjhima Nikaya is the, the work that they put together at the first council, that that was the reason of the rationale is to let's get the teachings of the Buddha down and that that was the Majjhima Nikaya was the events that came out of that. Um, uh, it took about three months for that conference to happen so that they could uh, pin down and what came out of it was the Majjhima Nikaya. There was older stuff already there. One of the big mistakes that we have is, is that we make a change in language by adding the word all. They say then that the sutta uh, were, were collected together all at once in the first century in uh, Sri Lanka. But then people begin to say, oh, that means that nothing was written down before then. Oh, no, all kinds of stuff was written down. That was when, in fact, so much stuff was written down during the Asok period. We know that stuff was written down then. That's because that's when the stuff was taken to Sri Lanka. 
And it was taken by one of the sons of uh, King Asok, who was a prince who went around gathering up all the written suttas that were there so that he could take that stuff to Sri Lanka to get it copied. So this is how kind of how we know many of the things like that. So another one is, is that we kind of know that the Dinganakaya was done in the time of Asok. And that what it actually was, was kind of like propaganda with the bait and the switch or the uh, the pacing and the leading of getting the Brahmins out of their Brahmin mentality into Buddhism. And by and part of the reason of doing that is by uh, kind of making fun of their magical beliefs. But the way that it was done by addressing an audience who already had those magical beliefs, when Westerners read it, they think that this this magic is built into the teachings of the Buddha. Rather than used as a way to help draw people so it's, it's going into their mentality. Well, the Buddha actually did that in several suttas, that he speaks to the Brahmins in the Brahmin language so that they can trust him and know that he knows what he's talking about before he teaches them the Dhamma. When the Western people read that, they say, oh, the Buddha is teaching all of this stuff. This must be Buddhism. It must not be Brahmanism. No, that was Brahmanism <laughs> that he was teaching to the Brahmins to prove that he knew what they were on about. Makes sense. I find okay. in the, the Samyutta Nikaya, there's quite a lot of magical thinking type stuff in, in there too. Uh, like when I've read it, there's quite a lot uh, mm -hmm. in there. <laughs> yeah, like I remember they talk about well, um, fairies, pixies, yeah. and the such, and not, them not liking the smell of garlic, etc. Can you speak up? It's a little hard to hear you. Oh, okay. Um, there's better. Yeah, I... I I had a collection of uh, Samyutta Nikaya at one point, and I remember reading through uh, a section about uh, magical beings and the interactions with them and them not liking humans eating garlic, etc. Um, stuff like that, yeah. Even even here in Thailand, the chance. Remember I came with you once, Damrata, uh, after staying at Wat Umong, and there was a chant, and the translation was there line by line. And it was talking about how the Buddha defeated a dragon, and it was chanted in Pali. There's a lot of this uh -huh. stuff in Buddhism. I mean, uh, uh, but that's because everything is symbolic, and if you yeah. understand the symbolism, for instance, when I'm teaching the Dhamma, I I do symbolic stuff all the time. Yeah. Now, um, in fact, there's the basis for that. The basis is the sutta number 139 in the Majjhima Nikaya, which is the advice on how to teach the Dhamma. And that one of the ways of teaching the Dhamma is by not making it overly personal. In fact, I have made that mistake on, on occasions by introducing the concept of victimhood to someone who says, well, I'm not a victim. And she slams the phone down and, you know, I never see her again because, you know, I didn't teach it in a way so that she could understand it and she took it personally. Well, one of the ways of giving examples where people don't take it personally is by blowing it up to something really great big. And if you see things in a really, really big, obvious, clear way, then the teaching then can be applied to the more subtle. Right. And so in the time of the Buddha, it was natural because everybody had all of these magical beliefs. So we use the magic as examples on how to teach the Dhamma. And so in that regard of the Buddha slaying the dragon or maybe not killing it, but at least uh, making friends with it and get it to settle down uh, would be that, in fact, he could have had let us say, any angry person who had gorilla mind or a dinosaur mind or dragon mind, and he subdued them by having uh, uh, a friendly conversation with them. Or it was probably it, Naga, but it was translated as dragon. 
precisely. And in fact, that's the whole point, a whole different world about the, the word Naga, which we had just started talking about in Thai. The word is Nu, uh, which has starts with an NG sound. But that Naga, yes. And and you see the, the, the overly done magical part is instead of them just dealing with a snake, they're dealing with a dragon. It's got to be a great big snake, okay? And then it's got to be really magical to where, in fact, the snake itself, large or small or whatever, was still just a metaphor for the mind anyway. That we do have snakes in the mind. That's, in fact, something that's uh, uh, referred to in horror movies, I think. Medusa and all of that. <laughs> and what does I that guess... mean? Go ahead. Okay. I was going to say, I guess sometimes I've had Dharma teachers that uh, they'll reference the Bible, for instance, when they know they're talking to Christians and they'll find some quotes, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they believe in the Bible or anything. It's just they know the crowd that they're talking to. And if they yes. say something like the kingdom of uh, heaven lies within, it might connect to somebody. Uh, but I can see how it could have, if you would have taken that out of context, then it, it could be, uh, yeah, it could be troublesome. Yes, and it is troublesome only for those who do not want to hear the actual teachings of the Buddha that they would prefer to cling to their magical beliefs. That makes sense. Uh, that um, there, there are suttas about this. One of them, again, in the Majjhima Nikaya, number 12, is the lion's roar. And the opening passage of that particular sutta is where a guy has disrobed and left the monkhood and has gone to the village and is there while the monks are going on Bendabat. He's complaining that the Buddha has no supernatural powers. He's not a superhuman. He's got nothing. <laughs> All he does is teach one thing, the Dukkha Dukkha Naroda. And he's pretty good at that. That's what this guy is out there spreading. But he is completely disappointed because he knows what the Buddha is actually teaching, but he wants something else instead. He wants something different. That there's a lot of people who really do understand that about the Buddha. And they reject it. They want magic instead. They want something powerful and important, and they don't want to go around happily recognizing that nothing really is important. They want things to be important. They want magic to be powerful. And they and so they will reject the Buddha, knowing what the Buddha actually teaches. Others of us, though, would rather try to accept the Buddha rather than reject him, but we're not accepting the actual Buddha. We're accepting something that a Buddha that we have painted the colors that we like. And that's, in fact, what you could say that has happened quite a lot in Thailand, though it's a Buddhist country. Yeah, but many of those people are, are painting their Buddha with the animism that was the part of the primitive cult religion of ancient Thailand. Examples of that, and you you know all about this, Marcus, is spirit houses. And another one is wrapping mm. uh, ribbons and pieces of cloth and all kinds of things trees. around large <laughs> trees. Yeah. All of that kind of stuff. But it's just ubiquitous all over Thailand. These little mm. spirit houses are big ones, in fact, in the Dusit uh, Hotel in, um, in Bangkok. They're right at the edge of Lumpini Park at uh, Selim Road and uh, Rama 4, huge hotel, and they have a spirit house out in the front where you have a, a drive around or a circle around for the cars to come in and park, and they've got this thing in the middle. And that spirit house is almost the size of a regular mansion. It's not a tiny little house anymore. It's a huge thing, and it's ornate and whatever like that, and it's up on a great big pedestal and whatnot. And that's the symbolism of uh, if we're going to build a great big hotel, then that means we got to um, uh, respect the owners of that land originally, the spirits that owned that land, and so we're going to make this fancy um, uh, spirit house for them 
in consolation for them losing their land. That's the the story that I have heard about uh, that. And I have seen some really, really strange spirit houses. Some of them are really high up on a pole. I've seen one of them that was suspended like a bird cage off the limb of a tree over a pong. <laughs> Usually the ones here in the north are, yeah, the, uh, sorry, raised by some kind of pillar, yeah. Well, there's another place, and that is, is that you, you have noticed, obviously, the Thai architecture for the temples, especially the ones, the big ones, that have a boat that's got very fancy roofs of a certain particular style, right? That's from that era of the ancient because there's no no other buildings in the Buddhist world that are quite like the Thai buildings. Even the Lao buildings are nothing like the uh, ornate uh, uh, structures that are of the uh, the Thai buildings. That's not strictly true because the Thai, the Lao also have quite a lot of that architecture, also. But um, m many of them are more like what So and Mok. In the sense of, why bother with that fancy building? <laughs> hmm, yeah. But that fancy building is another sign of Buddhism being, um, let us say, inundated with old magical beliefs. The building so, itself is magical, the way that it's built, with those arches and things like that. Very Chinese kind of in a, in a way. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, I was going to ask, so... Because you're you're referencing you reference two different sutras from the Majjhima Nikaya, and <clears throat> I often hear you reference from that book. If you're going to read suttas, would you recommend just sort of sticking to the Majjhima Nikaya? And are there suttas in there that you would say are kind of dangerous, or how do you how do you know which ones to read? Because sometimes I find it that it depends upon helpful. your intention for reading. Why are you reading? In other words, if you're reading in order to understand how to practice meditation, then I can give you a set of suttas to read where you can put those things together. Yeah, that's the idea. Okay. Yeah. There, but that's not the <laughs> only reason for reading the suttas. Another reason for reading is for cross-reference to make sure or to recheck or to redouble is this what I have come to understand from this group of suttas is can I find that same teaching throughout? Okay, and so cross connections is another reason that in fact, that's a really, really good reason and somebody can spend years doing that, making those cross connections. Yeah. Um, an example of that is like taking a topic like Paticca Samuppada and then go find every example of where any bit or piece of it is referenced. And what we find is in the things like in the Sutta Napata, the very, very oldest stuff don't have all 12 steps. They have about six or seven, but you can clearly see that the foundation of the Buddha's understanding of how the mind works was there with him from the beginning. But over the course of his practice, it was fleshed out into the full 12 steps. And so by understanding that progression of, in the Buddha's thinking during that uh, uh, sequence of, of changes and more completeness is really, really valuable. Um, there are other things that seem to be quite unique to the very, very old literature that you don't find in the more modern stuff, almost as if that it was kind of down home and country in the early days where nobody had any kutis. And by the time the Buddha died, kutis were common, that the, the monks would eventually get houses. But in the old days, they didn't have anything. So that kind of mentality meant that things were even open and more free in the early days. And you can see that in the early teachings to where uh, by the time the Buddha died, things had gotten rigid. That in fact, that's even discussed in the sense of uh, the Buddha admitting that over time as the number of rules has grown, 
the number of people who reach and attain the state of Arahat has diminished as a percentage. Which is part of the teaching about Sila Bhatta Paramasa is we get attached, even the monks get attached to the monks' rules. And that prevents them from being able to gain real freedom is because they're thinking about things in terms of rules rather than in terms of Dukkha, Dukkha, Naroda. And so the Buddha recognized that. And that's part of the reason why he recommended and, and gave permission for them to change. That in fact, that's what the second council was all about. And that council kind of interrupted in a brawl. It ended in a brawl. You know, a monk's very polite brawl, <laughs> but a brawl, because they couldn't decide what rules to abandon. And I think part of that had to do with jealousies. In fact, in, uh, if one main teacher criticizes another main teacher, then it does not feel pro proper for him when he goes into that council to abandon the rule that he's already criticized this other famous monk for. Oh, no, we've got to keep that rule. Otherwise, I look stupid because I criticized somebody for breaking that rule, which now we're saying is ridiculous anyway. You get the, get the perspective that I'm taking. This is one of the reasons why people attach to rules is because they've already been vocal about them. This is a, a, another example of that is in a meditation retreat. If a student has a, 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 a meditation experience. And then the next day he has another and another day at the meditation retreat and he forgets about it. But if he leaves that meditation hall and has that experience is on his mind and goes and tells somebody else about that experience. Now he's nailing it down and wiring it in is that this is important. And often what he remembers of the experience is not the experience itself. It was his first original telling of that experience. That's where we wire that thing in together. Otherwise, not saying anything at all, it's not even important. That makes sense. Okay. It's def I've definitely had that happen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've all had that. When I when I describe that, people say, you know, I think that's a common thing. <laughs> we really do that it that way. Don't tell anybody anything, because if you do, then that means that you've got to abide by that which you told. Here's a clear example of that is somebody says, I'm going to go on a diet. And a few weeks later, then they decide do not go on the diet. But if you go on a diet with a big announcement, oh, I'm on a diet, then he's much more likely to stay on that diet because his family and friends and all of that are, and he's holding them as his own expectations. But if he hadn't told anybody, then it's not important, the diet. If you tell it around, it becomes important. So getting back then to the, to the suttas, We've covered some important points, like the Dedinga Nikaya is 150 to 200 years after the death of the Buddha. And not only that, but that document and others, because they were literate at the time, that's what gave rise to within the next century where the commentaries come in. And then eventually the Abhidhamma. So we're talking about the, that time of period from 300 BC, or actually 250 BC, down to the first century BC. That time is when the Abhidhamma and the commentaries and all of that kind of stuff were done. And then all of that was recollected together in Sri Lanka. But they had already had uh, all of the suttas and stuff like that because they had collected those things in the time of Asok. So the first myth that we have to dispel is nothing was written down until the first century is not at all true. That in fact, the uh, part of the reason why we know that the Sutta Napata is ancient is from the language of it, which means that it was almost assuredly written down during the lifetime of the Buddha. Because that's the early stuff. Why would they keep the early stuff in separate documents and then have the Majjhima Nikaya that was done at the first conference without bringing that other literature in and making that part of their uh, thing. In other words, why not do it all? Well, they did do it all, but they already had so much already done 
in literature that they didn't have to redo that, that the Sutta Napata already existed. There's other references in the Anguttara Nikaya, which references specifically uh, sections of the Udana and sections of the Patitus, uh, uh, excuse me, the um, uh, Sutta Napata. So here we have suttas coming out of the second or the third century that's referencing these documents that were centuries old by that time, or that the Buddha himself was referencing documents that were done in his lifetime while he was there, because this is put into the words of the uh, or in the Buddha's mouth. So in either case, that also kind of proves that documents like this are not self-referential. Documents don't get that way. I mean, who's writing a book and the name of the book is, you know, uh, blah, 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 into town. And in that book, we're referencing another book. And that book is this same book. <laughs> no, we don't do that. I mean, that's ridiculous for us to do. But we can see all, oh, but the Anguttara at a later time is referencing documents that were already done. And that we can prove that by the ancientness of it, as well as the language is slightly different than the Majjhima But within the Majjhima its language is kind of jumbled up already anyway, to where with the Sutta Napata, it's much more stable in its language system which is another indication of this is a different document than the Majjhima Nikaya. This stuff must have been done be during the lifetime of the Buddha, not collected and written down immediately or just memorized and then written down many centuries later. So the the idea, uh, there, there's another idea that's like that too, and that is, is that the British, when they came, went to India, they were told that Sanskrit was widely used and widely spread throughout India. And the British believed that. The fact is, is that Sanskrit has had no more than at any one particular time in history, more than five or 600 people, maybe a thousand who knew the language. It was always a scholarly language. And the part of the scholarly was it happened exactly the same thing or the same way that the, that the uh, Majjhima Nikaya happened. And that was in the sense that it was a whole bunch of different languages in all of these old Indian literature, and they brought it all together in the original language. And that's why you have so many different declinations of rounds. You've got more than one because they're actually in the original. They were just different languages, and they just shoved all of that literature together and made it that way. That's part of the reason why Sanskrit is so complex is because it's not one language. It's just a whole group of languages. And so, uh, but the Western scholars thought that Sanskrit, and in fact, in in, um, uh, in modern uh, Western Hinduism and Buddhism, we still think that Sanskrit's a language. It's not, it's a whole basket of languages. Well, the Pali is also not just one language, it's not just Magadhi, it's a whole collection of languages that were very similar. And this stuff was put together that way. And that's why we have a lot of words that are not, we don't know the definitions of it. We have to kind of make up or kind of guess what those uh, words are. There's no real understanding of An example of that is in the ordination when each uh, ordinate is questioned directly, do you have any of the following diseases? And we're really not quite sure. We kind of got a really good idea of what this group of diseases are, but which poly word fits which disease, we're not quite sure of. But we do know that we got things like smallpox, cholera, tuberculosis, and that and those are the things why because those are communicable diseases and so we uh if somebody's got um uh cancer then that would not be a um <clears throat> a disqualifier but if he's got tuberculosis that is that's a disqualifier but which poly word fits exactly them they're not quite sure this is also true in the Thai that they're not quite sure because that was that's part of the fun about living in Thailand is because not only do we have the Pali, 
we've got the Thai, and believe me, the Thais have been really busy in doing this poly translation into the Thai for centuries. They've got about three main different groups that this done, as well as uh, monks like Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa is not content with any of those. He's going to do his own translations. So um, having those Thai translations really help us to understand how bad the English translations are. An, an example of that one would be Chitta or Sita. The mind. Guess what? That's not how it's translated into pa, into the Thai. It's translated into the word Jai, which is actually the heart. That it's not the mind that needs to be trained. It's the heart that needs to be trained. It's our attitude. Okay. And so, uh, uh, church in you know the I, I never so, made the connection with to the attitudes because in English the heart refers to emotion not attitude so that's a good pointer right there yes exactly so thank you for making that making that distinction yes that uh, in english the heart has to do with just emotions to where uh the jai uh in the thai language is a much more complete it's also one one of the words you would call it a universal word it's a word that's used in everywhere, like uh, Jai Dang and Jai Dam and Jai Yen and Jai, <laughs> Jai Ron and, and uh, uh, Plek Jai and Tuk Jai. And I mean, there's just all kinds of words that are using that because we're talking about the various states of mind that we're in. And so that's what Sita is about. But we even in English, we normally think of it as only the thinking part of the mind rather than uh, the fact that, oh no, that, that 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 part of the mind, especially the frontal cortex, has a different poly word. That word is manu, which gives us the word man, like in human. That's the, that word comes from um, uh, manu or uh, the man or actually the human thinking part of the mind. And the Buddha made that distinction. So it's not the manna that needs so much training. It's the sita or the emotion or the uh, uh, the attitudinal part of our mind. That's what's in need of investigation and gladdening up and brightening and that kind of stuff. And and a lot of us wouldn't know that because we don't have that connection with the tie. But the tie is very clear with it. That this is exactly what this word means, but the guys who did the translating out of the Pali, they didn't have the Thai. They didn't have the Sri Lankan versions of the, they didn't have the Burmese. And what kind of scholar do you know of who's going to have, be uh, proficient in six or seven languages just to make a translation from language A to language B? But in order to do that, we need language C, D, E, F, and G. <laughs> But I think that eventually that kind of research will be done so that we can get a much clearer understanding of what the, the suttas are really about. But it's pretty clear that the way that the suttas are done in English is very problematic, overly magical, overdone in, in many ways. Uh, one example of overdoing um, is the word dukkha by translating it into suffering. Suffering is really overdoing it because we're not suffering a lot of the time, but we're dissatisfied. And if it's either suffering and no suffering, then where is all that dissatisfaction in the middle? We got to put up with all the dissatisfaction because at least you're not suffering. No, I don't think that that's the teaching of the Buddha at all. So using the word suffering is a, is a poor, very Christian-like, boards and crosses and nails kind of Christianity using the word suffering when in fact dukkha actually just means uh, dissatisfied. Just like, in fact, in Thai, you have the word duke and the word suk. And they're yeah, common it's, words. It's not a hard D in Thai. I think it's duke or something. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the, so there are a lot of the Pali has come right out of the uh, the Pali canon right into the Thai language. All they have to do is just chop the end of the word off, whatever it is. So if it's dukkha, it becomes duk. But in Pali, there would be dukkha and dukam and duki and dukkha and like that. Um, Hoti and Hantu are the same verb. They're just different tenses because of the ending of the words like Latin. So if you know Latin, then you can understand exactly how all of this poly is put together. And if you don't understand Latin, then all of these are different words. No, they're not. They're all the same word. They're just a different ending depending on the tense and the case and the gender and all of that kind of stuff. But we also have the problem of overly grandiositizing the meaning of the word, like taking um, unsatisfaction and displeasure and turning it into something magnificent like suffering. So there's, though, I, I got to tell you, though, my favorite. My favorite is in, in even in Thailand, they use the word pendabat. Do you, you know what, Marcus, you know what pendabat is, right? When you go yeah. out the food, right? Yeah. Uh, pen, penda has to do with walking around, and bot is the bowl. Penda bot means walking with the bowl or walking around with the bowl. That's what it means. And in the Thai, it's a pot. In the Pali, it's a pot. With the Thai, sometimes they pronounce it with a B rather than a P, so it's a bot. But it also can be said with a P, and everybody understands exactly what you're talking about. So you can either say pendapot or pendapot. Either way, with a B or a P. But in English, monks don't have a pot. They have a bowl. A bowl is not a pot. A pot has closed in edges to keep the heat and the stuff inside. It generally has a lid. It generally has a way of being carried and it's used for cooking and storage of food. A bowl is open and exposed because you want the food to cool off so that you can eat it, right? Well, you don't have pots on the altars at Christian temples, but you do have chalices at bowls. Since it's a sacred object, we couldn't dare call it a pot. It's got to be called a bowl. <laughs> and I just think that that's so hilarious. I mean, it's like my favorite bad translation. <laughs> um, Makes sense. A pot, a pot is a lot more practical because it serves both uses, because you can just take the top off mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and let it cool off. That makes sense. Right. So a, a bowl is actually quite limiting, but a pot is yeah. universally useful. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, yeah, I, when I've lived kind of <laughs> when I've lived kind of simply, I, I do end up more with a, a pot being used more often when I'm out camping or something like that. Mm -hmm. the, the pot is more a useful thing than, uh, than a, sometimes you don't even bring a bowl. You just eat right, right out of the pot because, mm -hmm. you know, you want to keep your stuff light. <laughs> Well, you know, those guys back in 1880s and uh, forward to the 1920s, they knew that distinction. So okay. they intentionally chose. I mean, the word is pot right there in front of them and they take it and change it to the word bowl. I just don't understand that. <laughs> they actually translated a word wrongly that didn't even need to be translated at all. It just well, begging, copied. Well, begging bowl. I mean, begging bowl is like a English phrase, right? So. Uh -huh something that we're just familiar with. Mm -hmm. We're not used to a begging pot. That's not a thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's get a bit of chronological uh, understanding uh, of the suttas. The very first things that were done was the Sutta Napata and the Udana. Both of these are in the Kandan and the Kaya. There was also additional works that were done, but these are the songs of the monks and the songs of the nuns during the time of the Buddha that it was common for them to make poetry and to uh, uh, recite the poetry as well as to write the poetry down. When this was written down, I'm not sure, but it was all done in poetry and it was probably written down in the time of the Buddha. 
And that's the Taragitha and the Taragatha, also part of the Kundan and the Kaya. So that's the really oldest, oldest stuff. Then comes the Majjama Nikaya, and that was done at the collection time uh, in the first year after the demise of the Buddha. And then things kind of go up and down and back and forth uh, with various translations. An example of that is the Chinese came during that particular time that, in fact, there are suttas that are in Chinese that have been lost in the Pali and have been retranslated back out of the Chinese. Well, that shows the Chinese influence was from the about the third century B.C. A lot of influence from 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 China during that period of time. And um, also, it was at the time of a soak. Where a lot of new monks came in. And when they came in, they kind of like a university that's designed for 10,000 students and they've got faculty of 500 and now all of a sudden they've got 100,000 students, but they still only have the same 500 faculty. What are they going to do with 100,000 students? You know, the answer is we got a mess on our hands and that's what happened in the time of a soak that because it became the state religion with free robes, free bowls, free housing, free hangouts and all people from all kinds of places came to do that, and they brought their beliefs with them. And so then the students are teaching the students because they don't have real monks for teachers. This is what then uh, caused them to have a, um, a third council. And the third council was to reestablish what was really the teachings of the Buddha but they had signals or answering the right questions. And, and, and in fact, the, what I'm getting at is it takes one to know one that if you know the Dhamma, you can phrase questions to where if the guy answers the question in a certain way, you know that he knows the Dhamma. And if he answered it in another way, you know that he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> OK, so um, it's not exactly a password, but it might as well be. And so they had the meeting and it was, again, a very large group, but all of the monks who could not get into the meeting were unhappy. The problem with that, you see, is they had done it the old way. They would have just everybody was, you know, in contact and then they'll say, OK, on the full moon of this particular month, we're all going to be meeting way off in some wilderness place. Go find us there, which is normally the way that they would do it. But instead, this council was held in Rajgiri because it was going to it was being financed and supported by the king. Having it in the city was the mistake, because now you've got all of these other monks. Who didn't get into the council and they get unhappy and angry, and so they have a council of their own. And this was the beginning of the Mahasanga. This was the real split time that nothing was split up very much until then it, the splitting up was only because of regional. In other words, you could say, well, they were different down in Tamil Nadu than they were over in uh, Goa or that kind of language. In fact, they did make, did make it to Goa, but not down to Tamil Nadu. Sorry about that. But in any case, uh, the, there were regional differences, but there wasn't breakings to, into sex, hard sex, until the time of Asok. And this was the beginning of the uh, Mahayana. But that doesn't mean that all Mahayana is the same as is that because it's quite clear that the actual teachings of the Buddha has made it quite well and happily into Tibet and <laughs> into Japan and all of that, that there, there's no reason to say that, oh, well, that group of monks were now the Theravada. Actually, there was a lot of different names and there was wide variety of literature that has been sifted through so that there were various ways in other words when this group of monks um recorded this particular sutta and that group of monks recorded the same sutta there's naturally over time going to be some differences but those differences don't mean that they're hardcore sect differences not like what happened in the breakup in the time of a silk that was when there was clear breaking up of the uh uh uh, of the the Sangha. So that's also then the rise of so much literature. 
you see, when everybody's in agreement, there's not going to be a lot of writing going on, that everybody's doing the Majjhima Nikaya, and uh, then, in fact, the way that the Majjhima Nikaya was, was done was is that um, a different group of monks in a particular location would be assigned about 10 suttas. And this is the makeup of the Majjhima Nikaya. Those 10 suttas were grouped into 50s, and then having three baskets and that um that a group of people then would be uh keeping track of the baskets of the five groups and each group had 10 suttas in it so that's 50 times three is about 150 that's where the majjhima nikaya is broken up but there's more to it than that because once someone really learned their tun sutras in their organization, now they were free to travel into the group over there and learn their ten sutras. And so there was a lot of moving around with that, so that many monks wound up learning quite a lot of the sutras. But this is the way that the Majjhima Nikaya. So the Majjhima Nikaya for centuries was the literature for the for the monks. And so this is uh, uh, in Thailand, there's actually a movement. Perhaps you know about this, Marcus. The name of the movement is called the uh, anti Uh No, I'm not aware of that. I do know something, something that might begin with Maha, some kind of organization, Sangha organization uh, ruling from Bangkok. Um, and I'm not sure, maybe it's to try to keep keep the dhamma pure or that's its that's roots the, or something that's the they can it's called the anti-asok or the santi asok mm. um and it did get political but the whole original concept was is that if we're going to study the teachings of the buddha let's get away from all the literature from the time of asok back and go just with the oldest literature which is the Majjhima Nikaya, the Taragitha, the Taragatha, the Udhamma, the uh, Sutta Napata. And that's kind of a movement that, in fact, now they've got is almost a different sect in Thailand. It's a minor sect, but uh, the Upajayas within that group stay within that group. In other words, uh, they don't mix very well with others. Part of that is uh, a political stuff. But this is their point. But Bhikkhu Buddhadasa was quite into that also, that there that it's not necessarily just a political movement, but it's such a mass movement that a faction of it actually broke off and became a political organization on itself. I found it. What I, maybe I'm what I'm talking about is different, but it's the Maha Terra Samagama. Samatha. What's the last word? Uh, Maha Terra Samagama. Actually, that's just three Pali words. Maha Thera is the elder Thera, and Samatha is so. Is basically what that is. Is this? It's the old peaceful monk. That's what it means. The old monk, Maha Thera. Hmm. I'll paste it in the in the chat. The Oh, no, that's not the word that I thought. Okay, that's a different word. I don't know what that word poly is. But the word that I'm talking about is actually a movement in Thailand of uh, Santi Asok or Anti Asok or the time before Asok of getting back to just the teachings of, of the original Buddha uh, as opposed to getting too intellectual because, in fact, that's what's happened is, is that over the period of the centuries, Buddhism became more and more intellectualized, intellectualized into the commentaries, into the uh, Abhidhamma, into the uh, Vasudhi Maga and uh, Pasiddhi Bhaga, uh, and those kind of uh, works. But the real teachings of the Buddha is very clear there in the Majjhima Nikaya. And there's um, there's a few that we could get started on, and then in fact, if you wanted a, li a list, I would give you a list that not in any particular order, 
but number 117 and 118 work together very closely. One's the Anapanasati Sutta, the other one is the Great Forty, which is the exposition on the Eightfold Noble Path. I would also add Sutta number 24 and number 48, because that talks about the uh, the time frame or the practicing of the path. Then I would add things like Sutta number 22, the simile of the snake, and then we can really go from there and I can give you a whole bunch of them, like number two and number 12 and number 19, and the list goes on and on up to about maybe a third or so of, of the suttas, but each sutta is worth rereading because there's also interesting, valuable gems, ahas in every one of them. In fact, I would say that every sutta is designed around three big wake up points, three ahas. The first one is the story that starts the sutta. The second one is the middle where they get really into it. And that's often where students get stopped. They get such profound knowledge right there in the middle of the sutta, they can't go on. Only months later to go back and reread the sutta and find out, oh no, the real punchline was at the end of the sutta. <laughs> and so in that regard, reading the things over and over again, because over the months, they, they have profoundly different meanings to us because we're uh, in the beginning, we bring in so much of our own garbage that it's hard to see what's really there. But as we clean the mind out and get more and more pure, we can see things more and more clearly. And one of the things about the Western mind is, is that because of this issue of the magic, they want to read magic into it rather than learning how to read the magic out of it and take these great big examples and put them back into just mundane, ordinary mind moments. That what we call in English a dragon in the poly was actually just the word snake. And that was a metaphor. Um, one of the examples of that is the example of a monk. In fact, the reason that they call the Samanir Anu is because of a sutta to where a magical snake, magic again, but, uh, but it's still a metaphor for some human, but a magical snake was able to disguise himself as a human and ordained and took on the ropes. But then when he went to sleep, he forgot to maintain that he was a human and he went back into snake form and they caught him. Okay, now we can take that as a literal magical <clears throat> event. I can see that that's not really magical. It's just that the snake was actually a human being. But then when he was sleeping in the sense of being not mindful, he reverted back to his snakely activities and he was seen. So there's no real need to make it really magical, but if you want the magic, then naturally you're going to hang on to that kind of stuff. Another example is uh, the Gandaba, which is mentioned in, uh, it's in a very few suttas in, in several places, but in sutta number 38, the Buddha is talking about that when a woman conceives, and why he even bothered to put that paragraph in there, I don't know. He could have started with just the birth of the baby and gone from there. But he started with the conception that the, um, the woman has to be in season and union has to take place and that it has to be the right ambience or mood. Now, this word ambience or mood is the word in the Pali Gandaba, and it actually comes from the word musician or music. Okay, we know that that's actually not the case, that someone, in fact, can get pregnant in a rape scene, and there's no ambiance there. There's no mood music. There's nothing moody. Okay, but this Gandaba has been translated into English as not just the spirit of the moment, but the spirit to be reborn and the to be reborn is not there. That's added by the Western translator. <clears throat> the Gandaba is not a spirit. And so the joke is, is that Uncle Fred died. Uncle Fred died. 
He's now a spook. He's in the neighborhood. He won't stay in the cemetery. He's all over t this neighborhood. He's in town, and he keeps looking in the windows at night, waiting for someone in the neighborhood to be getting it on so that he can jump in and get reborn. You get that, that view? You've got a spook. You've got a, a, a ghost. And he's haunting the neighborhood, waiting for a sex operation to happen so that he can jump in <laughs> and get reborn. This is the mentality of Western men mind when they talk about it like that, to where the real aspect is nothing but the mood, the music, the connection. So... We In our English trans translations, there is a lot of magic added right on top. Never mind the ancient magic. Never mind the stuff that the, uh, that the people brought there or that the Buddha taught in magical ways in order to convince people that he was a uh, good enough teacher so that he could take them out of their magical thinking. That magic has been there all along. But in the Western translations into English, they've just made it so magical they add extra magic to it a clear example of that is actually in the word jati jati actually has the word it has to do with beginning or the start of something the opening and we could use also the word birth but when the Paticca Samuppada uses the word uh, jati, it's talking about the birth of the selfishness or the birth of uh, the being that's being born into dukkha or being born into a woeful state. But that born that we're talking about here is born in the sense of carry. Then, in fact, when we use the word born, that's what happens with you know, the woman is carrying the baby around. She's got a burden. She's she's born uh, with this object that she's got to carry. So this is what we're talking about is, is that it's a um, when when we grasp or cling. What is it that's doing the grasping and clinging? That's where the self is born. But in the uh, magical translations, that it don't doesn't use the word uh, the start of the self or the the birth of the self. They talk about it as rebirth. There's no re in the Pali. It's just the word jati. But it is so common to translate that jati word into rebirth when in fact rebirth doesn't exist in the Pali. There's no place in the Pali where rebirth exists. It talks about things in other ways, like other worlds. But one of the ways that they talk about other worlds is tata tata, which means here and there. It doesn't necessarily mean another world that's in outer space or Star Wars or maybe the future of the planet Earth in a Tomorrowland or something like that. It just means worlds that are different than the world that you live in. Can I ask a question then? Yeah. Um, one of the, I don't know, um, it's described, I, I don't know which collection it's in, but the, they said that the Buddha could, could say where someone's destination was um, after, after dying. And I think one of these was, um, who, who was the, the guy who made the park and everything? Um, and Anna, I can't remember his name now. An An Anantapitika. That's right. Yeah, and I think, if I can recall, I think he went to s some. Um, I'm not sure what it was now. Some some heaven. To see to heaven. Yeah, that's right. So mm -hmm. is that is that just his quality of mind as he was dying? No, it it's it's. Think of it as the funeral scene where the Buddha is reassuring people who are magically thinking. And he's just saying, oh, well, he's off in heaven. I mean, we do that at all kinds of funerals in the West, because he's in heaven now, okay? That's just, it's, it's much more polite to say it that way than to say he's dead meat. 
<laughs> so it's just out of respect to, to it's out of else. respect for the yeah. dead exactly it's out of respect for the, the people who are listening but we do not need to take that from a metaphorical into magical thinking all that proves that the Buddha believed that there was a two to heaven that's not the point That in fact, in the in the Pali, that the 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 Pali phrases that's used in funeral, uh, it starts with Anicca Wata Sankara Upatawa Yudamino Tesa Vipassana Tesa Su something Suko. It ends in Sukha, and what it means is that the death death is the highest of tranquility it's the highest peace being dead is a whole lot better than being in some two seat to heaven because when you're in two seat to heaven you've got to perform according to the two seat to heaven's rules you've got to do what you're told to do and being reborn there is like being reborn in any other miserable hell hole it's just a whole lot better hell hole in the minds of the people who are living in a worse hell hole and so there's nothing much to it to see to heaven other than as a kind of a magical existence of, you know, whatever, that uh, really we don't need to use those kind of things because the danger is, is that we want something that we can never have. That we want things that we can never, never have, and the more we want them, the worse we suffer without it. And you can see that, that that's very, very common. I see that in uh, very common in Western Buddhism because the Western mindset that grew up in the soup of Catholicism and Christianity and the kind of magical thinking that's part of our society it almost seems like that what happens is is that people leave Christianity because the magical story, they can see through it. It doesn't work. And they recognize that the Christianity is a failure at delivering that magic. So let's go see what Buddhism has to offer. Maybe it's got better magic. And that's why a lot of people approach Buddhism the way they do it is because they're looking for the same magic that they couldn't find someplace else. And I know I because have, that's, I was all over the place like that. I have a question sort of related to this. So <clears throat> some teachers that I've talked or heard talk, they talk sometimes about the, the hyper rationalism that happens in the West, that there's there's basically like no magical thinking, like no room for for anything, or, and arguably there's still magical thinking, it's just changed to uh, a different sort of magical thinking, but sort of the traditional Christian uh, sort of magical thinking has gone and it's become extremely hyper-rational. Uh, I, I would say I lived in Sweden for like five years, and I think 95% of Swedes identify themselves as either agnostic or atheist. Mm -hmm. uh, it's extremely rational, extremely uh only things that i see there's basically no room for that at all uh and some teachers that i've heard they say well it can be good to take some of these teachings uh not literally but to just include them i i don't exactly know why um but just as sort of an offset to this sort of harsh like scientific sort of mindset because yes okay that's the yeah. world that we're sort of raised in a lot like for me i was raised in a family that was like traditionally Catholic, but nobody actually believed that anymore. And so uh, it was just sort of, yeah, I, I would say more on the rational mindset. And what do you think about that? Well, OK, here we can start <laughs> with that by saying by using the metaphor of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. OK, the magical thinking is the bathwater, but they throw the baby out also. And this is the way that you can think of it is, is that a story has a moral or the examples that are used is in order to teach a real thing, but we're using magical stories to talk about it. If we throw the magical story out completely, we've got no story, we've got no moral. We threw it all out. We threw out the baby. 
Okay, this is what's happened with atheism, uh, but it didn't happen recently. That in fact there is a very clear definition of atheism in the suttas. And the definition that's given is upon the breakup of the body, the existing being is annihilated. Now, in Christian teaching, the um, the existing being is not annihilated. It's perpetual. It's eternal, or at least semi-eternal. And the distinction between semi-eternal and eternal is, is that eternal really goes on and on. And semi-eternal is, is that it goes on about that long, but it eventually ends. But it's so far into the future that it's effectively the same thing. Okay, so one absolutely goes on and on, and the other one absolutely ends, but both of them are so distant into the future that they're the same thing, really. It's irrelevant. Um, And so this is eternalism. To where nihilism would be, oh no, there was never an existing being in the first place. The body broke up, and so what? And that would be nihilism. That's not also the teaching of the Buddha. That this is the problem with the teaching of, of Anatta. When people hear there is either a self or a no self, really what the issue is is that there's no eternal self. There's no a perpetual self. But it's also not a self that breaks up at death, which is the atheistic. When I'm gone, I'm gone. When I'm dead, I'm dead. Okay. That basically the teaching of the Buddha is that the self does exist, but it arises based upon conditions. It arises based upon um, uh, causes, conditions. It arises and it passes away. And when it does arise, that's where dukkha can be found. And when there is no selfishness, there is no dissatisfaction. That when we're altruistic and we want to help other people, we feel good. When we want to keep all of our money, then we feel tight. We don't want to share it. It's mine. Okay, there's that selfishness in there. And so that's actually a quality that he's talking about rather than an object. Within the eternalism, the self is an object. Within the atheist point of view, also, the self is an object. Even in nihilism, the self is an object. It just happens to not be there as an object. But the reality is is that, no, it's not an object at all. It's a condition. When we, uh, Another way of thinking of it is, is that... Um, that with eternalism, that it it is actually an object like objective, that there is an object there. And that in atheism, that object dies. To where within Buddhism, there is no object, never was, but there is a subject that comes up and he goes away. And then he comes up as a subject again and he comes away. Then in fact, let us say that the arrow has been launched and it's fired and it's just flying through the air. No problem with the arrow just just flying through the air until the guy stands up and says, that arrow is mine, and he stands to get hit by it. Okay, that's the self, the one who wants that arrow. He wants to get hit with it. So um, that's a, a... uh, th- these are the kind of things that are described in suttas like the um, um, oh, number 22, where he's talking about the atheist. So let's go back to talk about atheism just a, mi- just a, a moment. Atheism actually is an argument with Christianity about whether God exists. Well, neither one of them are going to go anywhere with that because neither one of them got a basis of evidence. And so uh, if there is a debate, say, at a university or a church or whatever, then the audience that is sitting and listening to this debate in no case is going to be sufficiently changed in their perspective. So if you have a group of Christians come in and listen to a debate with a Christian and an atheist, they're all going to go away listening, thinking about atheism uh, as nothing, and we've got it, Christianity proved their point. But if it's a university where all of the students are an atheist and they have the Christian and the atheist um, argument, then they'll all walk away 
not having changed their minds either. Basically, the reason for that is because it's the wrong argument. The right argument is not, does God exist? The right question to ask is, do I exist? What am I that does exist? And that would be something that can be useful because if I don't exist, and in fact, if there is nothing left at the end of, of death, then even if there is a God, he's completely irrelevant because I'm dead. What can you do to me? I'm dead. <laughs> he can't dig me up to kick me in the ass. I'm dead already, already. <laughs> and so this is the actual argument that we have. Uh, and so if we are able to accept death, you see, even though the, the atheist is um, fighting against an authority figure, but he's not addressing the deeper question of the ex existential existence of himself. He's on the wrong track, arguing with Christians about whether God exists or not, because Christians have got that wired to say, sure, God exists. I talk to him all the time here. <laughs> talk to him. <laughs> of course, we have to talk, uh, respect that if, if, uh, uh, if God answers us, then that's called hallucination. That's the problem. It's okay to talk to God. Just don't think that he's talking back. <laughs> They'll put you in. So if, if you say, I talk to God in prayer, they want you in the church. But if you say that God talks to you, they want the same people want you in the psychiatric hospital, <laughs> not in their church. But back to the point about the atheist, the atheist, doesn't solve any problems other than the relief from the burdens of the religion. But they still have all of their past with them. That they, in fact, um, it's, it's not a cure. That is actually another kind of disease. It's another kind of magical thinking, as you were pointing oh. out. Can you... Um segue this into what um, Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa called spiritual disease. Precisely, yes, this is the spiritual disease. The spiritual disease is that we um, we want things spiritually that we can't have. That in fact, many, many people will change their materialism into spiritual materialism. And then instead of just stop wanting stuff, then they'll go into stuff like um, desiring desirelessness. They've heard desirelessness is really good, so I want some of that too. <laughs> and so um, that's the way that the mind goes, that that's the spiritual disease. He also refers to it as the prison of life, but he makes sure that you understand that it's not life itself is the prison but that that's where you keep your life is in your own mental prison. That's why it's referred to as a prison of life rather than, I don't know how to say it otherwise, but it's not that life itself is a prison, but rather that we imprison our lives because of the way that we're thinking, that we shackle ourselves with uh, a tradition. Here's something quite remarkable. The United States government has a thing called Congress who make laws. What would be if they had a new kind of rule and the new kind of rule is, is that every law that you pass, we have to unpass an old law that we've got so many laws on the books, say 10,000 laws, and we could have more than, but if we put a new law in, we got to repeal an old law. Then that would keep it dynamic. They would have to think, but no, what would they do is you just pile a new law on and a new law on and a new law on, and we wind up being completely law bound because there is no mechanism for the sunsetting of laws and, and things. Well, that's also true in all cases. Anything that gets established as a tradition remains viable regardless of whether it's got any value left in it or not, because we've been doing it that way. 
That's why the Buddha puts that one as the first item in the Kalama Sutta, is don't take anything by tradition. If it's been done that way before, we can stop doing it that way now and do something different. Just because if it's been done that way for long, that means that it's already too old to continue. <laughs> Let's do something new now. And so um, the atheists also get very rule bound and rule oriented. Rather than. Uh, and part of that has to do with intellectualization of things. They think that their freedom is going to become in uh, uh, wide ranging knowledge to where in fact the reality is, is that we only, <clears throat> we do not need the complete specifications, wiring diagrams and parts lists for the entire prison of life. All we need to know is where the tunnel is. And that's where the atheist is getting caught. They think that they have to know the entire prison so that they can figure their way out. And Buddha's got to, no, no, we don't have to figure everything out. We only need to know enough. Noble truth number four, right? <laughs> What's that? Noble truth number four. Yes, right. The Eightfold Noble Path. That's your digging equipment. That's that's your hole maker. Let's, let's start digging. Let's get out of here. Um, and that's also the way of this, the spiritual disease. So that's the reference for the spiritual disease is, is that we put ourselves in sickness or we put ourselves in prison or we put ourselves in these conditions. And what is that real condition? It's called dukkha. Anything that we don't like, that's it. That's the dukkha. And that was the original teaching. And everything else is extra superfluous, et cetera, like that. And yet people want the magic because being satisfied with little doesn't sound really appealing until you give it a go and you recognize how liberating that is, is to be satisfied with very little. No, we have to say, oh, oh, well, I want to be satisfied, but I got to wait until I get a whole bunch. And when I get a whole bunch, then I'll wait and be satisfied. And then we never get a bunch. All we get is just a little. So the, the actual teaching of the Buddha is actually quite simple. There's not much to it. And just a few suttas will cover that. And that everything else is just pinning that down and looking at it in this way and that way and another way and giving examples here and there, even if the examples are magical, they still have a moral to the story. Let's not throw out all of our stories that in fact, many of the Christian stories that are rejected by the atheist are actually quite good, quite valuable, quite wholesome. But some of the criticisms of Jesus would be that uh, give no thought of tomorrow is a bit overboard. What, he, what the actual teaching is, is just to be here now. Don't think about tomorrow, think about being here now. And that's quite valuable. But the atheists will look at that and, and say, oh no, you can't do it that way. We got a plan for tomorrow. One of, one of my favorites is uh, look at the birds in the sky. Uh, they, some, I don't exactly what it is, but it's something like the, they, they don't. Yeah, the birds of the air and the foxes have the, uh, their nest in the fields, but the son of the man, son of man has no place to rest his head. Is that the one yeah. that you're thinking of? Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like some, some of these things, like when I was kind of young and growing up as sort of this like hardcore atheist, I, I sort of ignored that completely that like, like, wow, I mean, there, there is something that there is, there's something there, you know, but there's, I had that reaction that you're talking about this sort of like, throw out everything there, there must be, be nothing there mm -hmm. um but as i've investigated as i've been older i'm like wow i mean some of this stuff it makes a lot of sense and especially when you come at it from a buddhist perspective with I, a buddhist really perspective jesus makes a whole lot of sense <laughs> right i mean he's just he's just sort of a, a homeless guy that's going around and like you know living kind of a normal life and that's making people happy and hang, hanging out with the lower classes of society and you know, I, I often think, man, if people had met Jesus, 
they wouldn't see him because he's hanging around with prostitutes and thieves and all these other people. Like they, you know, they, they would just ignore him. Mm -hmm. But yeah. (laughs) Well, I don't think that he was doing a whole lot of hanging around, but he also wasn't adverse to going places that he could do some good. Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's more like Mary Magdalene, you know, was part of his group and, you know, there are so many stories and they still don't know who she is. I'm good yeah. with, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know really what happened. A lot of yeah, that stuff true. we don't know. And I'm satisfied to not know. I can still be happy. Those yeah, kind true. of details I don't need. Yeah. That in fact, that's something that uh, back to the atheist, the idea is that we've got to cover all the bases. We've got to know all the information. We've got to get it all wired. There may be something in there that we've right. overlooked. Because we've done so much already and we still are not happy, so we must have missed something. Let's all go over it again. Yeah. Right? That's the mentality is, is that we've got to get it down 100% because right now we're missing something. And, and what's missing is the fact that they're searching. If they would stop searching, then they could be complete. Well, I think, and, I think you tend to see this in like psychiatry a lot because uh, a lot of times in, in sort of this modern psychiatry and stuff, they're, they're really sort of searching and saying, okay, uh, we, we haven't really figured out how to, to make people uh, happy yet. And so what we're going to do, we're going to take all these uh, enlightened beings and study them and figure out how they did it. So then we can teach it to some people in the future. So then everybody just has a super easy path uh, going there. And, and sometime in the future, everybody's going to, going to have it figured out and, and we're, we're making it there. Uh, this is a story that those guys all are all time. wrong because uh, Elon has a chip. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're all looking for magical answers. Yeah, I know. I know. Rather it's, than it's the, new the right answers. effort. Right. I, that's... All, I mean, I hear all the time in my, my sort of friends group that like, well, we haven't had it figured out yet. But sometime we're, we're going to get this all figured out and figure out how the mind works. You know? You're making my point and... for me. Exactly right. So <laughs> someday we'll figure it out. Someday my prince will come. Someday we'll figure what's going on out. And, and what they don't understand is, is that you don't have to figure it out. Just relax yeah. without having figured it out. You don't need to figure it out. <laughs> you don't need all of that. <laughs> Mm, this the attachment to uh, to knowledge, uh, which is a fetter, right? Uh, I don't think that it's actually. I would go so far as to say, uh, hmm. it might also tie in with a want for experience. Yeah, experience. In this case, experience and knowledge are the same thing. We're looking for knowledge because we want to put that knowledge in service of experience. So what's the knowledge without having some value in the knowledge? So the value in the knowledge is the experience. So that would be the way that I would go that, yes, that attachments to experiences. Because those experiences identify who we are. I am the one who had that experience. That kind of thing is um, uh, deep in there. To where, in fact, we see meditators often. That's a that's an important point about Western Buddhism. Is people are looking for experience. They're looking for attainments. They're looking for jhanas. They're looking for arahat. They're looking for nibbana. They're looking for all kinds of things, without understanding the second noble truth. Which is, if you want something, that's suffering. That's dukkha, wanting something you, you don't have. So if you want to be a soda pond and you see yourself as not, then you're seeing yourself as a failure. A better way to say it is, hey, man, I don't care about soda pond. I'm having too much fun. And that's being a soda pond. <laughs> So, yeah, that's a lot of it. The, the idea of, a, of attainments and all of that comes from the victim's mentality of I'm not complete. I don't have enough. I need more knowledge. I need more experiences. Then I will be whole. 
rather than recognize you're already whole. Just enjoy that. You don't need anything else. You already got all you need. And that's so hard for us who have been trained into being greedy machines. I mean, we are absolutely geared towards wanting. Mm. I think this is a cliche in uh, waiting for retirement, right? Uh Uh-huh. Oh, but you can't just retire. If you retire, you'll starve to death. You'll be an old man and nobody loves you and nobody wants you and you're just a shameful old bum. You can't do that. You got to retire in style. Which means you got to work and work and work for years and years and years to get your nest egg built up and then you can retire. Except uh, that story isn't isn't working so well anymore with my age group and a little bit younger because everybody's Congratulations thinking. Congratulations for waking up, kids. <laughs> well, but it's most <laughs> but it's mostly because the people are scared. They're like, oh, there's not going to be a retirement for me. That the world's going to end because of climate change. That tends to be the the new storyline thing that that happens. Uh, but a lot of people, they, I mean, I would say the majority of the people in my age range. They're like, there won't be a retirement from me. And they get sort of down on it. And yeah, but that, that starts to be the new sort ah, of but thinking. that's the whole point. They could get up on it instead. Why should I have to wait for their retirement yeah, with their exactly. money? Why don't exactly. I go ahead and retire now? Yeah. That's what I invite guys to do is to retire. If you're looking for, well, how can I survive? We've got plans. We've got watch to go to. We've got temples. We've got, I mean, in Thailand, they do not even have the mentality that if you don't work, that you don't eat. Quite often, people will have families and, and a third of the family don't work and don't intend to ever work. Um, that sounds pretty nice. <laughs> um, I have been in the situation and know of it personally that people if they are required to work over a particular holiday that they've already got family plans, they'll quit their job. They'll quit their job and go home for vacation. And when they finish the vacation and finish what they're doing at home, they come back to work and guess what? They come back to the same employer who more than likely will hire them. In the West, if you quit a company, you can't go back to work there. That's part of the um, uh, the stuff you mentality that they have of how dare you leave here. You can't come back. That was actually stated written policy by IBM when I worked there. You better not quit because you'll never work here again. And I think that that's quite common. But here in Thailand, all oh, you can quit your job and go back to work two months later and that's OK. It's funny, it reminds me, my, my dad got uh, fired from one Chrysler plant in Detroit and got hired by uh, another one because in the 70s, they, they, they needed so much manpower. They just didn't really care uh, what, your, what, your, what your resume looked like. He was like, you know, you just showed up off the street. As long as you had an ID and you looked like you could walk, they'd hire you. <laughs> well, uh, um. As we progress into the machines, I mean, for for centuries, machines have been taking care of human labor. Imagine for yourself how much trouble it would be to uh, to transport a, a big tree, a heavily fallen log, a half a mile to your house if you've got no rope, you have no pulleys, you have no wheels. You have no axes, you've got nothing, okay? So our tools have been labor-saving devices for centuries. Now the tools themselves are getting smart enough to where we don't have to, um, let us say, uh, manage them in so much detail. So an example that, in fact, I really like this happening with with Elon Musk is, is that most of the cars are made with machines, that his factory is a factory of machines, not a factory of workers. And you can tell the Democrats and the uh, uh, unions, they don't like that at all because he's putting people out of work. But I think that that's the future. 
that we're going to have to take care of our population in a different way <laughs> rather than forcing them into forced labor, which is what we've been doing now for well more than 100 years. And we need a new mentality, and, new, and the new mentality that they have is, is that it's okay for you to not work. You'll survive. You you can manage. I don't necessarily think that it has to do with a um, uh, a basic income that they're talking about, giving everybody a thousand dollars no matter what. That may or may not uh, do it. But another way of of going back to the guys that are beginning to think about quitting their jobs, they don't have to worry about oh what will become of me because people have been making that choice for literally thousands and thousands of years, and everybody survived. No one has died because they quit their job. Nobody's died because they have been fired from their job, but I know a lot of people have committed suicide because of it. But they're, that's because of the baggage in their own mind, rather than saying, oh, I got fired. Wow, isn't that nice? I don't have to go to that hellhole anymore. <laughs> I love it. But no, they get depressed and all of that. That's that's really crazy. I think that every, I mean, getting fired from a job, now that's celebration. I didn't feel that way in the 1970s. I got fired from a job and I moped for months. <laughs> Not recognizing that that was possibly the best thing that ever happened to me it was getting fired because it took me out of the rut that I was in. This has been great, but I'm going to have to head off. I so. know we've been jawboning about this and all kinds of things. Let's go ahead and finish this, Joe. Is there anything yeah. that we need before we go? No. Well, that's been great. Thank you, guys. I've really enjoyed just talking and. Uh, um, and mm. putting some pieces together for the sutras and whatnot like that. I hope that you got some value from it. Yeah, yeah. really helpful. Nice Other than see just you. the enjoyment of the nice moment. Nice to see you, Joe. <laughs> yeah, nice to see you again, Marcus. See you guys. Okay, Joe. We'll see you later. We'll see, see you, Marcus. Yeah. See you guys. Okay, bye-bye.